What's up, Facebook? I'm following Hannah's instructions on our how to create videos for social media class. And they tell me that I should do something cool and interesting at the beginning of the class to get your attention. So hopefully I have achieved success in doing this. I'm Megan. I'm here at the library. Behold, in uh, Mid-Continent Public Library here with Square One Small Business Services, we are coming to you live tonight with Erica Martin of Pixel Jam Digital. Um, she's going to be helping us tonight debunk what it is to make a website. It sounds hard. It sounds scary, but she's going to help make it very easy, very accessible, and help us understand what we need to do. We have a handout for tonight's class. I will be dropping the link in the comments. It's a Google document. So you should all you should have to do is click the link. You can email me. I'll drop my email if you have any issues accessing the handout. And um, we will drop that throughout the class so that you will have access to that amazing document. It's like 15 pages of tons of information that you're going to love. Um, uh, take a minute here in the comments. Tell us your name, your business, where you are on making your website. Do you have one? Do you need one? Um, you probably need one, even if you don't have one. And let us know who you are. We want to know who's watching. We want to answer your questions. So take throughout the class the opportunity to get in the comments. Let us know what questions you have, what we can help explain. We're here for you. You're giving us your night. We want to give you the help that you're looking for. Lastly, I will post a link at the end of the class to a short survey that helps us keep doing this programming for free on behalf of the library with thanks to the Kaufman Foundation for funding for our programming. So stay tuned, the link will come at the end, but please take a minute and do that. So I have taken two minutes. I said I would take one. With no further ado, I'm going to bring Erica on screen. Hello. Hi. So I'm going to take myself away, bring your slides up, and I'll see you on the other side. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. So my name is Erica Martin. I am the owner of Pixel Jam Digital, which is a website design and development company. I um, have always been a geek. <laughs> I graduated um, in, with a computer science degree and a minor in fine art because my brain really likes working both ways. I worked corporate and then I've also worked at an advertising agency. And in 2018, I decided that I wanted to do things my way, as so many of us entrepreneurs do and kind of take things into my own hands, do it my way. And so I started Pixel Jam Digital and have been running some for about three and a half years. So it's great. So my alt goal is always to help small businesses and sharing information through education and empowerment is a big part of what I do. So with that, I want to break down a lot of things about building your own website. We're going to talk a lot about kind of like most popular platforms, how much to, you can expect to pay, what hosting is, how to buy a domain, um, how to get started building your website. We're even gonna talk about a little code, just a little bit, it's okay. Um, when to hire a professional, how to hire a professional, and then there's a, I have uh, in that handout, you'll see there's a terminology sheet in the back. So kind of like a cheat sheet, if you will. Also, I am loving all of the comments on here about why you're starting a website. So please keep those coming. That's something I will nerd out about with you. All right, so we're gonna get started and talk about like very, very step one, why you should build a website. Um, I think in the past couple years, the pandemic has taught a lot of small businesses that being online is no longer um, like just a necessary or required, but it is critical, like having an online presence, whether it's to provide legitimacy about your business, um, providing a 24 seven sales channel. So, you know, if someone's trying to research your business at 2 a.m. while they're up with their infant, they can, they can access you. Um, also back in October when Instagram and Facebook went down for the day, one, I know a lot of us were more productive, but two, I think that was a good lesson on why you should have your own website presence and not just rely on another platform like social media. Plus, it lets you expand your marketing reach. Um, something that we're going to talk about later, SEO called search engine optimization. So when people go to Google and they search for a business or a service and then you show up, you know, that's some what that's a way you're being presented and your business is being presented without you having to do that extra work. And then for some businesses selling e-commerce or their services online so people can pay them online. All great reasons to have a website. So with that, let's kind of jump into website platforms. 
I do want to preface this with saying if you have a question at any time, I will keep checking my chat window. So please feel free to drop the question. I'm happy to pause in between sections. Um, so totally up to you. Don't feel like you need to wait to the very end. <clears throat> so with that, now we'll talk about website platforms. There are what I call a good top five website platforms. Some you might have already heard of. So there's WordPress, Squarespace, Shopify, Wix, and Weebly. I classify those as the big five. And they each do something a little bit different. They have a lot of overlap to them, but they're all just slightly different. So starting with WordPress, for my business, we develop a lot in WordPress, and that is because it gives us the option for tons of customization, whether that's brand colors, some type of coding or functionality, but it also gives you as the business owner a lot of access to the content so you can very easily edit the content. And that's why WordPress becomes so popular. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Overall, the cost, it's free to use. You do have to pay for a separate hosting account to make your website live. And we'll talk about hosting here in a second. But technically, WordPress itself is free. Some of the other pros are if you don't have the time or money to invest into a customized design, you can always get a theme. A lot of the themes, a lot of the basic themes are free or generally very inexpensive, like less than $25. So it makes it advantageous to buy into because it's such a low cost. Um, there's also free plugins available. A plugin is something that's going to extend the functionality of your website. The best example that we see frequently is a contact form. So you go to a business's website, you go to the contact page, and there's a contact form that sends a message directly to them. In WordPress, that term is called a plugin. Um, and then as a nerd, total nerd, I love that with a WordPress website, I can go and access the database. So if at any point in time, I just wanna work with the raw data, I can log into the database and do it that way. That is not something you can do with these other four platforms we're gonna talk about. Some of the drawbacks are, like I mentioned, it requires outside hosting. So not that it requires technical knowledge for it, but you do have to get a separate hosting account to host your WordPress website. And then some of the quality plugins. So there are free plugins available, but a lot of times what you'll find is the premium version or the pro version is gonna cost and have an annual fee. Usually it's gonna be between like 20 to $100 a year. So with that, it can add up kind of quickly. Um, and also if you really wanna get into a more advanced design or more custom design, it requires extra knowledge of HTML and CSS. So those are just a few of the like pros and cons of it. Really what I say is WordPress is best for users who want to have full control over their content or want to pro provide advanced functionality on the website. So something that they really want the website to do that these other platforms aren't going to give them access to. Um, I saw a quick question in here if WordPress is a .com or .org. Honestly, it can be either. And I'm going to talk about domains. So a .com or .org, that's considered your top level domain, or you can call it an extension. And we're going to talk about domains and purchasing that here in a little bit. So good question. I love it when people jump ahead. Um, Squarespace. So this is another one. Professional plans start at $18 a month. Now, there's no extra cost for hosting or anything. The only additional cost you would incur is if you want to set up e-commerce. Their e-commerce plan is $26 a month. So if you're anticipating selling products or services through the website, you would have to increase that plan a little bit. So you're looking at $18 a month to buy into Squarespace. Some of the pros are that they have a ton of very high quality templates available all for free. So I think it's really easy to create a beautiful website without having to have advanced design or graphic design knowledge or without purchasing a very expensive theme. Another benefit is it does not require any coding knowledge. The interface is all drag and drop. So if you want a picture somewhere, you can click on the picture icon, drag it over and drop it to where you want it. Same thing with text. So it's very user friendly to design with. And like I said, it's self-hosted, meaning you don't have to purchase additional hosting on another server. So it's all contained within Squarespace. You only ever have to look at that platform. Some of the drawbacks, um, like I mentioned, so when you get into the business plans or you want e-commerce, it can start to get a little bit more expensive. Also with e-commerce, you can only sell using Stripe or PayPal as a payment gateway. 
<clears throat> pardon me. So I'm going to tease just a little bit that in January, we're going to be teaching an e-commerce class. So that will dive into a lot of questions about payment terminals, gateways, all of that stuff. But so in Squarespace, you can either use Stripe or PayPal as your payment processor. And Squarespace does take an additional transaction fee. So you're paying over 3% on every single transaction that goes through your website. This is why I generally do not recommend Squarespace for e-commerce unless you have a very small scale e-commerce business. You also cannot access the database. So that's my nerdiness wanting to access the database and get to the data. And then like we mentioned just a little bit ago that SEO search engine optimization Customization is fairly limited on that. So if you're wanting to do some more advanced things to rank higher on Google, Squarespace is slightly limited. So I generally recommend Squarespace for small businesses who want a very reliable and beautiful website where they can easily modify basic content. So, you know, they're not anticipating going into their website every day and blogging. They're not anticipating needing to change the services every week you know it's a little bit more of a basic website and it's still going to look really nice for that price point and just checking in on comments over here all right so then i want to go to shopify shopify to me is like the exact opposite of squarespace shopify is primarily built for e-commerce websites and i'm going to recommend it for any large e-commerce store that wants advanced selling capabilities their package, their business package, which is Shopify Basic, starts at $29 a month. It is self-hosted, so you're not paying additional hosting fees there. Um, they also have plugins to extend functionality. I will note that plugins in Shopify are called apps, not actually plugins. So a little bit of terminology difference between Shopify and uh, WordPress. They also have starter themes available for free. And really, the best capability is you can sell thousands of items in Shopify, and it makes it really easy to manage your e-commerce. Their transaction fees are also relatively low. You, you end up paying less than 3% per transaction. So if you're used to handling credit card fees, maybe in a brick and mortar, you kind of understand there's always going to be that um, processing fee somewhere. So in this case, it's going to be less than 3%, which is very attractive if you're selling a lot. Some drawbacks of Shopify is that their business plan. So if you're wanting to have a more advanced and robust functionality for your e-commerce store, that's going to start at $80 a month and only goes up from there. So it can get relatively expensive. High quality themes do cost extra. So initially with WordPress, I was saying their themes might range from like free to $25. Shopify themes can range from free to $500. So they go up in price very quickly there too. And again, similar to WordPress, their plugins or apps, the more higher quality ones do cost extra as well. And there's usually, they do theirs by a monthly fee instead of an annual fee. So a lot of those are like $5 a month, $10 a month, but that can add up quickly. And then you cannot access the database for Shopify either. So if ever you are wanting to do something with the data, Yes, you can export like basic uh, analytics for your website. You can export basic e-commerce stats, but you can't get the entire database if you were ever to want that for whatever reason. So again, Shopify is best for large e-commerce stores who want those advanced selling capabilities and anticipate a fairly high volume of sales on there. Um, so I saw a question on here about using Printful.com. I have used Printful for several clients. I really like Printful in terms of order fulfillment. Um, I have worked with them through both a Shopify site and a WordPress website. And what I think they do is they provide the order fulfillment very easily for drop shipping, probably apparel, but something you want printed merchandise on. So please feel free to elaborate on this question. If I'm, if you're trying to run like a whole website through Printful, I've only done used them as an integration, but think it works great. I've had a lot of success using Printful before. Um, so then let's go to Wix. So we're going to talk about Wix for a second. Wix, their professional plan is twenty three dollars a month. So a little bit more than Squarespace, a little bit less than Shopify in the average range. They also have free themes and plugins available. Um, they also have a drag and drop interface, which makes it really easy to use, just like Squarespace. And again, they're self-hosted, 
So you do not need to buy additional hosting. Now, one thing I put in this handout and I put it in bold with Wix, you cannot export your website if you ever want to switch platforms. So I want to elaborate on that. What I mean is with Shopify, WordPress and Squarespace, say if I have a WordPress website and a year later, I decide I want to move to Shopify. I want to focus on e-commerce. What I can do is I can export my website, pictures, users, um, e-commerce purchases, content, select so like my about page, my services page. I can export all of that from WordPress and then re-import it into Shopify. I cannot export any of that contact, content in Wix, which I think is a huge drawback. So I kind of phrase that as you do not own your content in that if you ever wanted to move your website away from Wix, you're going to have to start over from scratch 100%. You still own your text and images, but you can't easily export all of that and recreate a site elsewhere. Um, personally, I think that is a huge drawback for business growth. I like that Wix makes it really easy to get started if you have limited funds available, but I, that is their biggest drawback in that if you ever plan to switch, you're gonna have to start over on your website. Um, then their transaction fees are also a little over 3%. And then comparatively, they have a lower page speed time. So it takes a little bit longer to load their websites compared to some of the others. Um, and again, you cannot access the database. So Wix is best for users who are just getting started. They have limited funds. They have limited time to set up a full-fledged website. I will always say a website is better than no website. But if you have the options and you have the time to invest a little bit more into a different platform, then I would encourage you to go with a different platform over Wix, mainly for the fact that you can't export it. And then there's Weebly. Weebly has the lowest cost plan and it's only $12 a month for a professional plan. So that price point, I know it's very attractive, does not require coding knowledge. It is also drag and drop. It is also self-hosted. So you're not looking at any other outside fees. And you can accept e-commerce payments via Stripe, Square, or PayPal Express. So in that way, it's really similar to Squarespace, but a little bit cheaper per month. Some of the drawbacks for Weebly, you are much more limited in your design capabilities. Their blogging capabilities are also very limited. Um, it has poor multi-language support. So if you know that your audience that you're going to be serving on your website is multilingual, so English and Spanish, English and French, um, something to that degree, then Weebly might not be the best solution because it has poor language support. It's also not as great for that search engine optimization. It's hard to customize that for better performance. Their transaction fees are over 3%, again, so just a little higher, cannot access the database. And with these professional plans, because they keep the monthly cost so low, you have to pay extra to get technical support. So if ever something goes awry with your website, there is an additional charge to have that tech support on hand and available to help you with your website. So if it's nice in that it's a low cost, but that cost can be deferred elsewhere if you ever need that technical support. Um, I wanted to follow up on the printful questions that were coming in through Facebook. So uh, with printful.com, Yes, it was connected to WordPress and linked via their API. So it sounds like that's exactly what you're doing. They do not lock you into any contract. It's kind of a pay as you go situation, which, which makes that very attractive. Um, and then I only left Printful for one of my clients because they wanted to print a higher volume of orders with a local vendor. So instead of having a drop ship situation, the only reason they changed is because they wanted to hire a local um, print shop and like fulfill big orders so they would keep inventory rather than doing one order at a time. So that was the only reason they left. Nothing bad there. A couple other uh, website platforms to be aware of that I just like to touch base on is Webflow. Webflow is relatively new. It's a couple years old. It's a combination between WordPress and Squarespace. I'm still trying to decide where they fit in that top five category um, since they are so relatively new. Bubble.io is brand, brand new, like just as of earlier this year. So I'm still trying to evaluate them as well. 
And then what you might find, and we're going to have a long talk about GoDaddy here in a little bit, but GoDaddy has a website builder as well. It is the most similar to Weebly if I were going to compare them. Um, long story short, I'm going to tell you to stay away from GoDaddy as much as possible, and I will explain why. But GoDaddy does have a website builder also. Um, professional tip. So I always like to provide professional tips when I'm teaching my classes. Website professionals will not generally work with a Wix or Weebly website, and that is because they're so limited. So as a web professional, I know what certain best practices are. I know what I want to implement to really make and build a successful website. And Wix and Weebly won't let me do that to the full extent. Therefore, I don't like to work in those platforms because then my expertise is being limited by the platform. And so I generally encourage customers to do Shopify, Squarespace, or WordPress if they were choosing, if they had the ability to choose another one of those rather than Wix or Weebly. But again, a website is better than no website. So if you're on a Wix website right now and you're thinking, oh no, Erica, I'm on Wix, that's okay. That's totally okay. It's just, if you're looking to, into platforms and you're starting new, I would not encourage one of those two. Um, before we talk about website hosting specifically, are there any more questions? I'm just gonna scan through the comments here. Take my sip of water. It doesn't look like there's any questions yet. Okay, so let's talk about website hosting. Website hosting is where your website lives on the internet. So if you wanna get very literal, it's gonna be on a server or on a box somewhere in the world. Now, um, it's also probably on more than one box or more than one server located in multiple parts of the world, but that's essentially what hosting is. And there's some certain things to consider if you're getting, say, a WordPress website and you're looking into purchasing hosting. I will say right away, don't go with the cheapest option because they'll end up being drawbacks. But things to consider, so one would be performance. Performance is the uptime and downtime. So how often does a website go offline? How often does the hosting provider temporarily shut down the server to do routine maintenance? Is it every day? Is it once a week? Do they do it, you know, at 2 a.m. when you're likely to have the least amount of traffic or does it happen at 1 p.m. when you usually have the most amount of traffic? Also with performance, where are their server locations? So if your primary demographic for website users are located within the United States, you want to make sure your hosting company has a server located in the United States. That proximity helps speed things up. If you buy into a hosting that's in the United Kingdom, you know, if you literally think about that distance, it's going to be slightly slower, but those milliseconds of deferred loading time are going to play a role in how your website performance goes. Also memory, how much data can be transferred without the site crashing? So we all hope as a small business, we either go viral or something happens where we get tons of sales, tons of website users, um, tons of donations, something to that effect. So pretending that happens and all of a sudden you have thousands of users on your website all at one time, is that server able to uh, send your website to all those people at the same time? What is that memory limit? Or if you have a small memory limit, which can happen with cheaper hosting plans, what ends up happening is your website crashes and goes completely offline because it cannot serve all those users at the same time. So it's just important to think about. The next one is security and backups. And this is where I'll kind of elaborate a little bit more on my anti-GoDaddy policy. But the question is, what happens what will the hosting company do if your website gets hacked? Um, GoDaddy was recently hacked back on, as recently as November 17th, their work uh, managed WordPress servers were all hacked. And GoDaddy released a statement saying they will not be supporting their clients as to linked, or, uh, leaked data, leaked information, or any like malware or security that is now found on the website. So that is a big red flag to me as the web developer who wants to ensure the security of my customer. Also, if the website gets hacked and you have to start over, do you have a backup? Or again, do you have to rebuild from scratch? So just very important things to keep in mind. Also with customer support, it's really great when a lot of these hosting companies have live chat because then you can log on, do a 24-7 live chat if anything goes awry. 
and get help pretty quickly. Um, otherwise, it's good to know how quick are they going to reply to something like a contact form submission. And then access to cPanel. So cPanel, when I was saying getting access to the database, that's all cPanel, which is short for control panel. That's going to give you access directly to the server so you can see what software it's running. You can get to the database if you want to manage um, some advanced settings for emails or domain names. If you want to have advanced firewall security, all of that is going to be located in cPanel. And not every hosting provider will provide access to that cPanel. Again, GoDaddy's managed WordPress does not give you access to that cPanel. So then you're having, if you have hosting issues, you can't get into it or your web developer can't get into it. Next, and this kind of goes back into security, but this is more on the front side of your website, your SSL security certificate. So um, over the past five years, you may have noticed that if a website does not, most websites now have an HTTPS and then the forward slashes and the domain. If a website does not have that S, which is what the SSL security certificate does, it's for secure, then you might find in your browser it says um, website may not be secure, website is blocked, proceed with caution, something to that effect. So that became a requirement a few years ago where you have to have an SSL security certificate on your server to make sure your the connection for your users to your website is secure. It protects the data as it's being communicated back and forth to help maintain privacy and integrity. A lot of platforms, especially higher end platforms, are going to give you that SSL security certificate for free as part of the hosting plan. Other lower cost hosting platforms are going to require additional charge. That's why I'm going to bring up GoDaddy again. So with GoDaddy, they have these very attractive, you know, like four or five dollar a month plans. But then you have to buy your SSL security certificate separate. And then you're looking at about another eighty dollars there. Um, so it's kind of it becomes a hidden cost. Best hosting provider. So um, I recommend there's a kind of a few hosting providers that are depending on where you are with your website or how advanced you want the setup of your website to be. Bluehost is the easiest to set up with WordPress. It's a fairly low cost. They provide a free SSL security certificate. They have the option for backups. And it starts at, I want to say, their promotional pricing. So the first year is usually around $6 a month, and then it goes to $12 a month. So very easy to set up and a low cost. Then WP Engine, SiteGround, and Cloudways. They require a little bit more advanced knowledge, a little bit, they have a little bit more technical requirements to get a WordPress website uh, set up fully. Their cost is usually $10 to $15 a month, but they have extra layers of security, backups, 24-7 um, security monitoring if something does happen to your website. So you're paying a little bit more. It requires a little bit more advanced setup, but they provide that extra value with security protection. And then Cloudflare. Cloudflare is going to require the most advanced level of knowledge to get set up because essentially you're creating a server from scratch. So it's, it's called a virtual server. So anyway, Cloudflare is really great. It is super speedy. It's one of the fastest out there, but it just has more technical requirements to get it set up. Then I am going to say worst hosting provider. So again, if you're looking at hosting providers and you see one that's not on the best hosting list, just make sure they're also not on this worst hosting list. So for that, probably no surprise, I'm gonna say GoDaddy. I'm also gonna say HostGator slash HostMonster. They're kind of a similar company. And then SiteFi. They provide, um, they have very attractive pricing because they're very low cost, but they do not have the best security features. They do not have great backup options or those security and backup options have quite a heavy cost that's additional to what you're paying for hosting. Um, GoDaddy's live chat support seems very attractive because they do offer 24-7 chat support, but the drawbacks get then when they are hacked and the company as a whole doesn't provide support for you or data protection. Um, it's kind of like a trade-off. So they have very face value support, but then when it comes to the important support, it's not there. So the pro tip I had on here, again, was just to reiterate about GoDaddy. They were, their managed WordPress was last hacked on November 17th, and it's just honestly not the most reliable hosting company out there. 
Um, 10, 15 years ago, it was fantastic. But as, they, as they've grown so much, their services and value have kind of deteriorated. Um, all right, so let's check in with the comments before we move on to domains. So just kind of looking. Someone asked, is WordPress a great one? Um, yeah, so I like WordPress. Again, I'm biased because I'm a data nerd and I can access all the data and do a lot of like advanced programming or customizations for a website. So that's why I like it. As the end user, business owner, the person who's managing the website, that kind of comes up to you. I've had some clients say they love working work with WordPress. It's really easy for them to navigate and use. I've had other customers say they've tried WordPress. It didn't, they didn't like it. And so they'd rather go to Squarespace. So a lot of the time I will find that people are torn between either WordPress or Squarespace. And it's kind of just how their brain works and perceives the website when it comes to editing. So if you're looking at the two and saying like, okay, I really don't need advanced functionality. I need something more basic. Um, then maybe check out Squarespace. The nice thing about Squarespace is you have a free 14 day trial. So you could always, you know, buy into Squarespace, try setting it up, try playing with it. If you find it is more limited than what you want, then go to WordPress. So that kind of makes that a little bit easier if you're trying to decide between the two. Squarespace, um, on a, another note, as a developer, it does have some limitations. So if I'm wanting to do an integration with Printful, for instance, I can't do that as easily or as seamlessly as I could with WordPress. With WordPress, those integrations just feel and look like part of the website. With Squarespace, it usually ends up linking to another page or whatever that is that's outside your website. So it, again, it just depends on what you're doing, what the long-term goals are with your site. Um, let's see. Does WordPress offer hosting? So WordPress.com does offer hosting for a WordPress website. I do not like their hosting options because it's very difficult to navigate some of those cPanel aspects. Um, so really, if you're thinking of going with a WordPress website rather than doing a WordPress.com hosting, I would look into something like Bluehost. It's going to be about the same cost, but Bluehost is a lot easier to use and has that 24 seven live chat support, which makes it easier. Okay, let's get into domains. Um, I have joked before that I could also have an entire class just on how to buy a domain name, which probably no one wants to listen to and that's fine. So I've consolidated a lot of that information. So a uh, TLD, top level domain, that is gonna be your extension for your domain. So that is a .com, a .org, whatever that dot something is, that is your TLD. As a business, I know we all want to go after the dot com. That seems ideal. That's what a lot of people think of when they're thinking of going to a website, which is great. But also everybody has a dot com. Some people's pets even have dot com. So it can be tricky to find the perfect dot com for your business because that dot com might already be taken. So one thing I like to talk about are there are different and other alternatives for top level domains other than .com. A .org is traditionally used and was intended for a nonprofit or a charitable or religious institution, but you do not have to be one to own a .org. So if it's something where you have a .org available, you could use that for your business. A .net, I like to joke that it's not 1999, so a .NET is better to have as a backup domain rather than your primary domain, just because it's more of an antiquated circa Netscape era for domains. .edu, .mil for military, and .gov, gov, those are strictly reserved for their corresponding institutions. So. A .edu is post-secondary institutions, .mil is for military use, and .gov is for government or public sector organizations. So those you cannot readily purchase like you could a .com or a .org. You could, however, do a .us, which is short for United States. They have one for every country, .ca for Canada. And so if you're looking to have a country code as your top level domain, that is certainly an option. Now. Personally, for my business, I have .digital. So my website is pixeljam.digital. And then I also own 
pixeljamdigital.com that redirects to Pixel Jam Digital. That dot digital is considered a secondary top level domain or a secondary TLD. It's another extension that can be used. And this became um, a thing, so to speak, about 10 years ago. So going to nerd out for just a second. I can, I C A A N. They're kind of the um, main managers of the internet. They decided that people can have additional top level domains that don't have to be a .com, .org, .edu or something to that effect. So in my case, I wanted to go with .digital since that was part of my brand name. Um, in the handout, I have a link to ICANN's website that's gonna give you the full list of all the different secondary TLDs. Sometimes you might see .co, .club, .agency, something to that effect. Now, I will say these domains cost just a little bit more, not a ton more, just a little bit. So if you're looking at a .com and that's going to be $11 a month, a secondary TLD is going to be more like $20 a month uh, if it's not of high value. So again, not a lot more expensive, just a little bit more, um, but it's really nice to have, especially if it's going to fit your branding in a certain way. Just checking through the comments real quick. So then I also have in the handout, I'm uh, going to encourage you to check that out. I have a breakdown of the right way to buy a domain name. So one thing, you know, just like I mentioned, location based for hosting for the server, you also want to look at the location for your domain registrar. So the domain registrar is who you're buying your domain from. So you want to look, make sure if you have a U.S. Uh, based website that the domain name is being served from the United States as well. Domain extensions. So you might find that not every registrar also offers some of those secondary TLDs. Some might only have the primary top level domains. So that's a good thing to look at. Registration period. Um, usually when buying a domain, you're looking, you might be looking at like one year, two years, three years, probably as a small business, you want to go into that three year mark just to make sure you have it for quite a while. And, um, but you do have the chance to renew and you're not owning that domain forever, just in case. But some domain registrars let you register for up to 10 years at a time, which is kind of cool because you can set it and forget it. Then also you're talking about auto renewals. So say if you only have your domain for one year, not sure if you're gonna use it, you only buy it for one year. Some registrars, which I think is fantastic, will let you set up auto renewal. So then it's, automatically going to renew so you don't lose that domain. I will say once you lose your domain and it goes for sale, it is very unlikely you're going to get it back. I have seen that happen a few times where a client has just totally forgotten to renew their domain, their credit card changed, what have you. And as soon as their domain went up for sale, someone else bought it. And so they had to change all of their like, um, marketing collateral to reflect the new domain name because they kind of had to start over. And also with some domains, they have expiration protection, where if your domain expires and you have auto renew turned off, it keeps it from going on sale for the like 15 days or 30 days. So it kind of gives you like a grace period to get your domain back. Also with domain transfers. So there are tons of domain registrars out there in the slide or in the handout. I have a link to accredited domain registrars. So those are like I can certified like, yes, these are legit domain registrars. You should buy your domain names through. So saying again with GoDaddy, you know, even I bought my domains through GoDaddy a long time ago because GoDaddy has super cheap domains and they're so easy to buy. But then it, when I get to a point and I want to transfer that domain from GoDaddy to say Google domains, not every domain registrar will let you transfer your domain to a different one. So it is important to keep in mind, like if that were to happen, Maybe in 10 years, someone wants to buy your business or your, buy your nonprofit. And so you have to transfer everything over to them. Like having that ability to transfer the domain as well is very important. And then pricing. So I mentioned pricing earlier about domains are going to cost around $11 a year, maybe 20 if it's a secondary TLD. One thing to look at in the pricing is if you have to pay extra for what is called domain privacy. So domain privacy prevents your information from being broadcast to the internet that you just bought a domain. 
what likely happens if you do not have domain privacy is you're going to receive a ton of extra spam in whatever email account you use to sign up for that domain or whatever email account you use to buy that domain. So that who is privacy, depending on the domain registrar, kind of like the SSL security certificate, is going to already be built into the price of the domain. Some it's not. It's not in GoDaddy. It is in others like Bluehost. So just when you go to buy that domain, if you haven't already, check to see if that who is privacy is included. If it's not, that's totally up to you. If you want to buy into it or not, just know you will very likely get a ton of spam for the next six months in your email. Um, and my pro tip for this is a lot of hosting providers will give you one free domain when you purchase hosting through them. Bluehost is a great example. So with Bluehost, when you purchase hosting, you get a free domain name. Now, what I like to encourage with this free, free domains is to use them as what I call a backup domain. So like I said, my primary domain is pixeljam.digital. And then one of my backup domains is pixeljamdigital.com. So if a client or lead of mine types in pixeljamdigital.com by mistake, it automatically redirects them to the correct website. So I usually suggest that uh, you can have as many backup domains as you want. If you have a business name that maybe gets misspelled fairly often, you might want to purchase misspellings of your business name as a .com and have them all redirect and point back to your primary domain just as a failsafe, just as a backup, and then you own those domains and you can kind of have them available. So before we get started on talking about how to get started building a website, let me check the questions. Um, meaning through comments. Oh, I understand now. So yes, WordPress.com has free and WordPress.org has costs associated with it. That is correct. So, um, and I kind of misunderstood your question. So I apologize for that. So with WordPress.com, that is going to be best if you are having a personal website for blogging purposes, not any type of commercial business, so to speak. So the WordPress.com um, lets you set up your website for free. It's going to be very limited in the back end of what you can do. But if you're trying to write a blog that you do not plan to monetize because they don't allow ads, but if it's just strictly for blogging, WordPress.com is great. WordPress.org, yes, does have the paid plans available that offers hosting within WordPress, kind of like I was talking about. So thank you for um, asking that clarifying question. And um, so follow up on the privacy can be set manually in WordPress. Yes, to some degree, but there's also additional value in setting privacy in your domain as well. So it's again, when you're looking at security and privacy settings, you can have them kind of everywhere. And it just depends on how much extra security or privacy you want to have for your website. So like I said, with your domain, when you buy a domain without who is privacy, it just opens that email account up for being spammed. Um, same thing with your phone number, whatever phone number you use, it opens up to get more spam calls with it. All right, so let's get started on the how to get started building your website. So the first thing is prepping the tech. So that is choosing the website platform. We just talked all about website platforms. That has to be your first choice. If you decide to go with a WordPress site, you'll also need to choose your hosting. Um, those can be kind of set up concurrently with purchasing your domain. So depending on how you're wanting everything to flow, you could purchase a domain, then choose your website platform and then choose hosting. You could do vice versa and do platform and hosting and then domain kind of up to you. And then something you're going to want to do, especially for a nonprofit or a small business, is set up an email account for your business that is entirely separate from your personal. Um, again, this is more of a recommendation for like long-term thinking so that everything for your business is in one spot. You can also always change over your email after the fact, like for your domain or for your hosting or for your website platform. But what I generally encourage is just using a free Gmail account that's like your business name at gmail.com just so you can start putting all of the techie side of things, all the software signups, whatever, under that email address. You can always create a professional email address later, but having that free email address makes it really easy, especially because um, with some things, 
something called two-factor authentication or 2FA. And this is kind of a minute detail about the tech, but a lot of these require this like double check-in where they send a code to your email or to your phone. So it's just kind of nice if it's like an email that's dedicated to your business. Next, you are going to want to outline your content. So I recommend you start with the primary pages, which is your homepage and about page, services or products, depending on your business, and a contact page. Those are the four primary or pillar pages that you want to have. Um, that is what people are going to look for if they want to learn about your business. And with the about page, as much as I want you to talk about your business or organization, I also want you to talk about the why. Why did you start it? Why did you found it? Um, talk about you a little bit. That humanizes your business and your brand just a little bit more. Um, but having all that information on there. The home page, essentially, I want you to think, what do I want my user to know within 15 seconds of coming to my homepage? If it's just one thing and you want them to contact you, great, put a big pretty button on there that says contact us and it takes them to the contact page. With the contact page, I highly encourage having as much contact information as possible. It makes you seem more approachable. So phone number, if you have it, email address, social media channels, and your physical address if you have a brick and mortar. Um, you know, I don't know if you've been in the situation where you're shopping on a big company website and you're like, OK, I need to contact customer service and nowhere do they have an email or a phone number like you just have to submit a blind contact form. So having that contact information really helps. It also, again, getting into search engine optimization just a little bit. It signifies to search engines like Google, like, hey, we have information and we provide good customer service and good value because we want our users to contact us. So it's goes both ways. It's beneficial to users and it's beneficial on the technology side. Then your services and product pages, just make sure you provide moderate detail. So if it's as simple as listing them out in a bullet format, great. If you want to elaborate and have, you know, the name of your service and a brief description, fantastic. Just so that information is there and available to a user or potential customer who has a question. Then we want to get into adding images. So I will say professional photos are going to be stock, be better than stock photos any day of the week. Um, I know when I look at stock photos and I see all those pictures of, you know, a family dressed in white and they have a white room and a white couch, like it's very obviously staged. So having stock photos is still going to be better than having no photos at all. I know professional photography can get fairly expensive. So if you're trying to create a website with a very low cost to get started with, stock photos can be good. Um, I always want to point out, downloading images from Google is technically copyright infringement. So please don't do that. Please don't go to Google Images, find something, right click, save as, and then use it on your website. That's a no-no. So instead, some free or inexpensive stock imagery resources that I frequently use and I encourage my clients to use, I have listed in the handout, but they are Unsplash. Um, they have beautiful, beautiful images in a fairly large selection that are all free to use. And you can download high resolution sizes, all free. Pixabay, P-I-X-A-B-A-Y. They have more basic stock photography. So it doesn't really look like stock. Um, it's a little bit less high resolution, more like medium resolution, but again, they're all free to use. And then two others that I absolutely love. One is the Gender Spectrum Collection. So they have more, um, a, they have a wider variety of non-binary imagery, which I think is fantastic. And then also Create Her Stock, all of their stock photography. So if you've ever gone to look at like um, I stock photo or something. Sometimes the diversity is really limited. So create her stock features black and brown women and all of the same typical stock imagery settings that you would imagine, but they're just beautiful, gorgeous, and they have a low cost of, I think it's only $10 a month and you can download unlimited high resolution files. So they're also a great resource. And then um, one thing I want to say when it comes to getting those high resolution images, on your website, and I'm gonna talk about this as far as best practices go in a little bit, but what's really important to note is not putting those super high res images on your website because that's gonna slow down your page loading time. So in the handout, I linked an app called Squoosh App, not just because I like to say it, but it's free to use, it's in the browser and you can upload any high res image 
format it, change the settings, and it's going to give you like a slider for before and after, and then output a much lower resolution of that file, a much smaller file size, which is really nice if you don't have Canva or if you don't have pro software like uh, Photoshop, because those can get expensive. This is a completely free solution that lets you downsize your images, so it's great. Then you're going to want to test and launch your website. So it sounds simple, but go through your website pretending you're a user, pretending you're completely new. Click on things. Click on everything. Make sure there aren't any broken links. Make sure there aren't any spelling errors. Um, try and submitting the contact form on your website. And then go back and make sure you did receive that contact inquiry wherever that might live in your email or within the website platform, wherever that might be. Then you can publish, or I'm sorry, then connect the domain to your website, and then you can publish. The domain is essentially kind of like the address for people. So instead of having your um, home address, you have your domain name, and that tells the World Wide Web where to find the actual information on your website. So then you can publish, and then it's live for everyone. Um, Quick check-in, I'm gonna talk about best practices for maintaining your website next. So I wanna see if anyone has any additional questions or uh, follow-up commentary so far. All right, so we'll move on to best practices for maintaining your website. As a web nerd, I'm gonna say that collecting and analyzing data is super critical. Um, there are free tools out there. Google has a lot of them. Google has Google Analytics, and that allows you to look at how your users are using the website. So here's where I say as a user, it gets kind of creepy, right? Like when you know websites are collecting all this information and everything. But as a marketer, as a business owner, it's fantastic because then you can see what's successful or what needs to be improved upon. Google also has a product called Search Console, and that lets you see how your website is performing for SEO. So it shows popular keywords you're ranking for, your most popular pages on your website, how Google interprets your website, all of these different things when, that can be really great for ongoing improvement and enhancement on your website. And so then you can use, you know, these are just kind of two tools that are a baseline for all of my clients. You can always have other tools. There's a lot out there. Um, there's one called Hotjar. It, it does heat map tracking. So it shows you on average where people's mouses go when they're scrolling the website, which buttons they click on which sections of the website they tend to stay on and look at more, but in terms of a heat map, which can be really interesting too. But those cost money. So starting point, Google Analytics and Google Search Console. Then keep creating content. So starting a blog can sound really daunting when you're already limited on your time as a business owner um, to then invest additional time on writing content. So you don't necessarily need to think of a blog as blogging about your personal life. It could be used to showcase your expertise around your products or services. It could be used to find related uh, topics around products or services. So there is a tool that's semi-free. It's called Answer the Public. And if you type in one of your products or services to it, it's going to show you a map of all the questions people tend to ask in a search engine related to that topic. So the who, the what, the why. I say it's semi-free because I think you get two free searches a day. Um, you can always sign up and pay to get more, but it's two free a day. So then if you're at a total loss for content, you can go here and say like, okay, people are asking questions about how to build a website. Maybe I should address that as a blog topic and write about it. Um, and then as far as maintaining content, if you can, which, I honestly am guilty of not doing as well. Aim to write one blog post a week. That is gonna show search engines that your website is staying relevant. You are continuously publishing new content on it and you are trying to provide the best information to your users. I know that is incredibly difficult. I tend to write one maybe once every two months because I am guilty of that as well. But again, that is a best practice. And then update your primary pages on your website as often as you can. So products and services page may be a couple times a month. Your home page might just be once a month. You, you know, you might want to change it for the season. And then your about and contact pages 
probably aren't going to change that frequently. So just whenever those need to be changed. All right. So any other follow up questions on either, again, getting started with your website or best practices for maintaining your website? And then from here, we're going to talk about the basics of HTML and CSS. So again, just just a little code to get your feet wet. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and continue. So HTML, I'm not going to quiz you on it, but it does stand for hypertext markup language. Um, it is essentially describes the structure of the web page to the browser. And of this, it consists of a series of elements, and each of these elements tell the browser how to display that content. Um, so something that you don't necessarily need to know on a regular basis, but I always like to highlight HTML and CSS because if you're editing your website and suddenly you see like a tiny fraction of code somewhere, instead of thinking like, oh no, my entire website's broken, I need to call somebody. You can say, no, no, that's an easy fix. I can fix that really quickly. No problem. I know a little bit of code here. So what you'll tend to find is that these elements are all represented by tags with the angle brackets. And I'm going to show you some examples here and say, oh, yes, there is an example right there for bold. Um, so you're going to see these like brackets on either side defining that middle part. So in this case, the example be for bold. So it's making putting an emphasis or bold on whatever's between those brackets. Um, and these could be headings, paragraph tags, bold tags, italicize, um, tables. There are hundreds, but what I'm going to show you are more, or what I want to talk about are more examples of like the paragraph or the heading tag, because those are going to be the most common that you might find. Web browsers themselves do not display the HTML tag. So if you hit publish or save changes on your website, you go to the web page and look, and there's like, some hanging brackets there, then probably somewhere the code got broken and it's missing a bracket. Um, so you can think of it as a foreign language. The basic structure of HTML is formatted and directly influenced by newspapers. So the header of your website, in this case now where you have like your logo, that was originally the title for the newspaper. Um, the navigation on a website would have been the publish date, the issue number, that information. And then sections, you know, you have your front page of a newspaper, you have your above the fold of the newspaper, you have different articles in a newspaper, and then the aside is kind of like the classifieds, like it's extra information or maybe the advertising section on a newspaper. Like it's going to be more narrow, it's going to be off to the side because it's not primary content. So when you look at a website, Websites were historically modeled after newspapers. Then getting into CSS. So CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets, and it is the visual language of the web. It is going to specify how all those HTML elements are going to actually look and appear. So the HTML tells the browser how to structure everything, and then the CSS tells, tells the browser how to style everything. And they're called cascading because those elements will inherit the styles from like the above element or the parent element. So if you have a headline that is bright red and then you have text that is red underneath, um, it could be that in your CSS, it's defining both of like the headline is red and then the text is getting to actually, or I'm sorry, accidentally becoming red because it's inheriting that property. So that would be the size of your fonts, which fonts you're using, the colors, um, what links look like, like if they're an underline link or a button, stuff like that. So some of the most common HTML and CSS tags, again, one is going to be a headline tag. So you'll see that as an H1, H2, H3, goes all the way to H6. That's going to be like the title or the subtitle of sections on your website. P is going to be for paragraph text. That's generally going to be slightly um, longer text. Like if you're writing a couple sentences all strung together, they're going to be in paragraph tags. Then as an example for CSS, a span tag, S-P-A-N, that's usually going to have some information in it about the like how it's going to look. You will most likely see this if you ever write content in a Microsoft Word document. 
copy it and then just paste it over into your website platform. A lot of the times Microsoft Word is going to bring over all of that formatting information with it and you're going to see it in terms of span tags. So if you copy it over, paste it and it looks kind of funky, look at that HTML and CSS because maybe there's span tags in there that were brought over from Microsoft Word. And then you have an anchor tag, which is really just represented by an A, and that's going to identify links on your website. So you have the href, that's going to be the reference wherever that link is going to go off into the World Wide Web, and the text in between the brackets are what's underlined or as the button or however it's formatted. That's what the clickable link is. So if you are just overwhelmed and want to know more like okay erica i want to learn more about html and css there is a free resource called w3schools.com i remember using it back in college to like look up things um honestly they have such great detail on how tags and elements and css is structured i've even gone like okay wait how do i write that again let me go reference it on w3schools Fantastic resource. It has a ton of information. It even has tutorials and walkthroughs if you want to take kind of like a free HTML or CSS class to learn more. So that is a fantastic resource. Um, real quick, let's check in for any questions. And then I want to talk about hiring a professional. So I'll pause real quick if anyone has more questions about that. Okay, so when it comes time to hiring a professional, at what point do you, as the business owner, as the nonprofit organizer, whatever it might be, when do you really want to like consider hiring a professional? Um, so I use examples as if you're ready to start selling products online, but you don't know how to set up your payment gateway and accept credit cards. That could be a good time to consult with a professional to get that part set up. If you're wanting to connect another piece of software to your website to share data and information, a great example of that is setting up an email newsletter. So when you go on just some website and usually in the footer it says sign up for our newsletter and you enter your information, that is directly feeding to an email platform. Someone is hopefully is not manually like waiting to see those come in and then they manually enter everyone's contact information into their email platform, but it's syncing some way. So if you're not really sure how to do that, it could be a good time to consult with someone. Um, also, then kind of more longer term, if you're wanting to really optimize for search engine optimization and grow your organic performance. So how your website appears on Google and Bing and DuckDuckGo and Yahoo and all of those search platforms. If you, want, if you want to improve your search presence, that is a great time to hire a professional. Then if you want any advanced design or any advanced functionality that requires more coding, again, hiring someone. Um, and then hopefully it doesn't happen, but if you broke your website or if your website gets hacked and you don't have a backup and you're not even sure how to continue um, consulting with someone then too, and they can provide a lot of great tips. So then it gets into which type of professional to hire. You have your web designers, you have your front end web developers, and you have your back end web developers. Traditionally speaking, the web designer is going to be the person who primarily focuses on images and design, not necessarily any of the programming or functionality. That would go to your front end web developer. Your front end web developer is going to ensure that website visitors can easily interact with the website. So the contact form is working. All the uh, payment processing goes through successfully to your bank. Kind of like those details. Um, they're not all appearance, but they do know how to do a lot of the appearance things. Then you have a backend web developer, and that's going to be someone who is strictly focused on database and code. So this is probably going to be a more advanced requirement for you. So if you're like wanting to do some advanced functionality with your website or build an app or have an app extension in some way, that's when you'd want to talk into a backend developer. You might also um, hear the term full stack developer. That is technically what I consider myself to be. It is someone who does the design, the front end web development and the back end web development. So someone who kind of knows all three, they have graphic design skills, they have HTML and CSS skills, and then they have other additional programming knowledge. So the reason I like to just identify what the different terms are or the type of professional to hire 
is because when you're reaching out to people and they say they're a web designer, but you need help more with programming things, you might want to look for a developer instead, unless they say something to the effect that they're a full stack web designer. And then how to hire a professional. Um, always ask around your network for referrals. Other small businesses especially will usually have hopefully fantastic referrals or maybe recommendations on say like, oh, you know, I didn't have great communication with so-and-so, so I do not recommend them. Um, and then a lot of these professionals will offer a consultation. So scheduling a free consultation with them, either in person or virtually, just to have that conversation with them, tell them what you're wanting, to get feedback from them. Um, hopefully they can give you either a rough estimate during that consultation or after the fact, they will send you a full-fledged proposal outlining the details of what the cost is going to be. So either way there, make sure you have you know what you're going to be paying for. Um, also request to see a portfolio of work. You know, ask them, say, hey, what are some recent websites you've built in Squarespace? What are some recent websites you've built on WordPress? Like, can you just send me those links? Or maybe you want to talk with that business owner if they have time and just say, like, how was your experience working with them? Um, and then also sign a contract that outlines the scope of work. And this is really to benefit both the web person and you as the business owner. The scope of work for web-based projects can change fairly easily just because um, how websites can be so dynamic. So having a full like scope of work or those deliverables detailed for both parties is going to be mutually beneficial. Then you're on the same page and you know exactly what's going to be delivered along what timelines. Then the cost of hiring a professional, that can vary quite a bit. So I saw on here that someone is using a designer from Fiverr. So usually you can expect um, someone um, Fiverr, Upwork, or any type of virtual assistant. They're probably going to be running in the $25 to $50 an hour mark. Um, me, my standard hourly rate is $100 an hour. So for a professional that's not necessarily a freelancer, but they have a business or an agency, you're going to look at $75 to $150 an hour, um, just as a rough estimate ballpark. And then a custom website from an agency. So custom website being, you know, the agency's writing the content. They're finding the images. They're helping um, brand the website. Uh, coordinating multiple drafts, like it's very hands-on for them. Those custom websites, I'm sorry, are going to start around like three to $4,000. A more basic website that has just, you know, those four primary pages and limited design or limited functionality, that's probably going to be closer to like one or $2,000. So again, when you're talking to someone, a lot of things can vary for the pricing of a website, how many pages, if it's going to be e-commerce or not, how many products do you have for that e-commerce, all of that can directly affect the cost. But this is just like a rough estimate or a ballpark st for starting numbers. So then if you take this and you're ready to hire a pro and they quote you $50,000 for a four page website, you might want to think mm, that's too much. I don't think that's what I need and try and consult with somebody else. Okay, so that wraps up a lot of what we were going to talk about tonight. And now I want to open it up for more questions kind of as it relates to building the website, domain, hosting, website platforms, best practices, what have you. So please feel free to drop your questions into the chat and we can talk about them. So I saw one on here, can that be done by the person who is building the website? Uh, very possible. I think that's going to depend on what the scope of work for them is. So if you've hired a web designer, again, they might be well versed in some front end development as well and be fully capable of doing. Um, so earlier we talked about that printful integration. They might be fully competent to do that printful integration or you might hire a front end web developer that can also do design. So that's just really going to depend on what their skill set is. And that's something you can define in that scope of work saying like, okay, here's what I need. Here's what I want to agree to as a deliverable from the website professional to me, the business owner. So good question. More questions, please.
And so um, one thing that I had briefly teased earlier, I am going to be teaching a class coming up in January on e-commerce for small business. And that's going to get into a lot of the specifics of setting up an e-commerce store. So we're going to talk about point of sale systems. If you also have a brick and mortar uh, payment gateways, there's Stripe, PayPal, Square, Authorize.net, talking about inventory management within your website, shipping, you know, how to integrate shipping on a website so it's being calculated dynamically, um, how to set up product information, how to do product descriptions, like the whole spectrum of having an e-commerce business and also talking a little bit more uh, about those top five website platforms and how they uh, can facilitate e-commerce shops in a little bit more detail. So if you're, if that's something you're interested in because you're wanting to sell online, or if you're already selling online, but you're on a marketplace like Etsy and thinking about switching, this would be a fantastic class for this. Um, so new question, how long does a full service website to, uh, how, what is essentially the turnaround time for a website? I was given a 30 day, 30 at the least. Great question. I generally quote eight to 10 weeks, but that eight to 10 weeks isn't like we talk, you sign a contract and then you don't hear from me for two months. A lot of that are, um, we have a kickoff meeting. The kickoff meeting is always fun because we get to look at other websites you really like and maybe websites you don't like as much. To, so I can kind of know how to design everything. Um, and we have two draft reviews. So I work on the website. I submit it to you, get your feedback. We have a virtual meeting for a review. I then take that again, work on all the edits, make the changes, pass it back to you. And we have a second follow-up meeting, making sure, again, links work. It's mobile responsive. Um, we're not missing any content somewhere. There aren't any misspellings. And then I have a final draft. So that final draft is kind of you just giving like a one more check over. Then what I do is set up all those Google services. So Google Analytics, Google Search Console, and getting all of that done. And then we launch. So generally speaking, I estimate about eight weeks. What I find is that as a business owner, I totally get that from your priority list, this might be a little bit lower. So sometimes if I'm saying like, hey, I need your logo, I need your branding documents, I need photography, and it might take you you know, a couple days to get that to me, that can kind of direct that time or um, impact that timeline a little bit. I have done websites in as little as four weeks because it was a fairly simple website and just um, we were able to communicate very quickly with the client. And so it went very quick. I've had some websites that have taken almost a full year just because they've got delayed or postponed for whatever reason by the end organization. So I would say the 30 days being the minimum completely makes sense to me. A lot of website professionals, if you tell them like, hey, I need this in two weeks, could I pay extra or could I pay a rush fee for it? They might allow you to do that. They might have an, a service option that is kind of like a rush charge. So you could expect to pay more, but it would be done in less time if that's something that's really critical for you. Um, what are some good, easy to read font combinations to use? Oh, lovely question. We could have tons of discussions on that. Um, so I would recommend, first I wanna talk about font size. So at a minimum, think 16 pixels. So if you ever see teeny, teeny, tiny font, I know browsers are great in that you can now zoom in on a web page, but that kind of like changes some formatting on things. So 18 pixels is like a good recommended font size. Try not to go smaller than 16 pixels for any of your body copy anywhere. Um, and then as far as fonts go, so pairings, you might see a different pairing for like the headline could be a sans serif and the body copy could be a serif font. If you search for font pairings, Google has some fantastic resources there that are free and you can look for font pairings there. Google also has their own font service, so to speak, that's free. And so you can either link those fonts to your website or download them to use in other marketing materials. Um, Canva, I believe, pulls in a lot of those same Google fonts, and Canva also has really good resources on font pairings. So I would say it's better to think about legibility and readability on the web. So um, not having text that's super squished and narrow, but also making sure your text size is a decent size so your average person can read it. Um, now, one thing I also want to talk about, which 
could be a whole other class, is website accessibility. Um, it's really easy to want to build a website for your uh, user who is um, neurotypical, who doesn't have any eyesight problems. I mean, these are fake glasses. I'll be totally honest, they're blue light blockers. <laughs> um, someone who doesn't have uh, trouble with reading comprehension, anything like that. We want to build, you know, it's so easy to build a beautiful website and it's like, look, this looks great. But then you get into website accessibility. Maybe font sizes are too small. Um, I've seen that be a big trend where you have teeny tiny paragraph text that makes it really difficult to read. So if someone has any type of vision impairment, it makes them difficult to use your website. Or if buttons are too close together, you have a teeny tiny link somewhere. So trying to be mindful about website accessibility and not building it for the best case user, but trying to think of your specific audience. If you have an audience who might be, you know, 60 plus and you know that they tend to increase their um, Zoom on their browser or they sit up really close or they have readers on, then maybe you want all of your font sizes to be slightly larger than that 18 pixels to be more accommodating to them. Um, it's also important to kind of think about website accessibility in terms of screen readers. So if someone is using a screen reader or screen assist software, it's going to read to them the link names, the picture names, all these things. So it's not just necessarily about font sizes. I know that was a bigger answer to your question than what you had initially asked, but it was a good lead into talking about website accessibility. Um, so question, so, okay, so Fiverr doesn't allow direct contact or video via Zoom. Yes, that is entirely true. When you're working with a, um, what I'll call a freelancer, through a third party, you are very limited to going through their platforms. So I have not used Fiverr directly, but I've used Upwork before and I've had that same experience. So that's kind of a, um, I don't wanna say get what you pay for, but because you're using that platform, you're very limited to sticking within that platform. So you could always say like, maybe is there a time we could do a one-on-one, -on -one, but you two will be online at the same time, just chatting through their messaging system. Um, and so, yeah, if you're not selling products yet, and that is a goal of yours, that e-commerce class could be extremely beneficial. More questions. Oh, yes. Can you get sued for not accommodating persons with disability? Yes. So um, it is very unlikely, but I forget what the year was, but look up the Domino's Pizza website accessibility lawsuit because Domino's Pizza, if you order from them, they have this like really cool order tracker and it has animations and it shows like the pizza being cooked and all this stuff. So anyway, yes, the Domino's Pizza website um, was sued because their ordering system was not accessible for someone who was vision impaired. So they could not, their screen reader could not interpret that order tracker. They filed a lawsuit and they did win. Um, so Domino's Pizza website accessibility lawsuit, I think if you Google search that, that should get you to the information on it. But yes, um, if you have a website that you are a, an accommodating a very large population and um, you're not catering you know, to everyone where your content is very inaccessible, yes, that is a possibility. A very, very low possibility, but it is a possibility. So. Website accessibility standards um, are important to know. A lot of these website platforms are going to automatically incorporate all the best practices to make sure your website is accessible. Um, but there, you can always customize it in such a way where maybe it becomes less accessible. So points to consider as a business owner doing your own website, contrast. You know, not putting, if you have a white background and teeny tiny font, that's in a light gray color, it's going to be really low contrast and hard to read. So making sure that font color is, um, has a high contrast to your background and it's a larger font size. It's basic stuff like that that can be totally lost when it comes to designing sometimes because it's like, oh, I want to design it to make it look really good and trendy and pretty, but then you lose sight of the accessibility. So there's kind of like a balance there to consider for accessibility. Um, what font would I suggest for an e-commerce store? Oh, it, that's kind of up to you and your brand. Let me take a sip of water real quick. 
And so if you have a very well-defined brand um, and your brand has a logo, font pairings, colors, brand voice, all these things, then I would say stick with, with whatever is in your branding and that's for consistency purposes. If you do not have a well-defined brand, then I would encourage you to find something that kind of matches your brand as a, uh, from a graphic design perspective, if you've ever heard or seen a meme joking about Comic Sans and how it should be strictly used for teachers or like kindergarten teachers, um, let's say if you're an attorney or a law firm and then you use Comic Sans on your website, which is a very playful, very silly font, that's probably not gonna represent your expertise and services very well. So trying to find something that represents what you're doing, what your level of expertise is, your level of professionalism, and then incorporating that into your brand. So again, just making sure it's easy to read, easy to view. Um, so font size in terms of disability, again, that kind of depends. That's where I recommend, you know, 16 pixels is the bare minimum. 18 pixels is what I would generally recommend. That is how I build all of my websites unless it is somehow um, requested otherwise. And um, there is also a class so it was just dropped in the comment section. But if you are interested in having like learning more about branding and setting up your brand, all of that that goes into that, they have a brand for beginners class that you can check out. Um, let's see. Kind of scrolling through. So yeah, any more questions or any more food for thought or aha moments that kind of came to you during tonight's class? Um, and one thing is, so just like I mentioned earlier with consultations, I completely offer free consultations through my business. They can be 45 minutes to an hour and they're virtual through Google Meet. So it's one of those where if, you know, you're kind of feeling stuck and need some basic direction or you want an estimate or something to that effect. Um, myself, along with a lot of other web developers offer those free consultations. So that can always be a benefit if you're just, again, getting started, have a couple additional questions, you had need some clarifying answers to scheduling a consultation with someone is a good next step to do. And you are very welcome, Denise, for the class. Like I said, I love teaching it. Um, I want all business owners to feel really competent and comfortable using their website, managing their website, posting content. It is so mission critical anymore. And I totally get that feeling of overwhelm when it comes to like trying to build a website, manage a website. Honestly, I have those exact same feelings when it comes to accounting and tax stuff. I hate it. I dread it. Do not like it. So any way that I can help break down coding languages, website platforms, all of that stuff, I am happy to provide that information on. Um, can you mention an average price for a web designer to build a simple website? Good question. So if we're talking about a four page website, so that's homepage, about, services, contact, maybe have a blog in there for a fifth page. Um, if you are doing a very basic design that requires very little customization, I would say probably around the $2,000 mark. If you're going with a professional who is going to like fully customize the website, they're going to incorporate more functionality. They're going to already incorporate SEO best practices and do like a little bit more than the basics, then that's going to be closer to like four or $5,000. If you um, contact a web professional and they're between like say $500 and $1,000 for pricing, just again, ask what all their scope of work is going to entail. Um, it might be somewhere where like they don't write any of the copy, you have to provide all of the content, all of the imagery, they're not even gonna source stock imagery for you. So just you know, asking them those clarifying questions like, okay, what does this price point entail? So those lower price points are probably going to have less deliverables to go with your website. So thank you, Priscilla, for that question. So yeah, feel free. We still have a few minutes left. Ask more questions if you would like. 
Um, Diane, you are very welcome. I'm glad you feel encouraged to work on your website, depending on what stage you're in. And um, the handout is linked in the comments. So it, again, it's like 15 pages long. I could not help myself. I wanted to give you as much information as I could. It details everything we talked about. It has links in it to go to all the resources I mentioned, and then it has a glossary at the very end for some of the terminology I mentioned. So make sure to download that from Google so you can have it on hand. And then um, also in the comments is the link to the survey in case you wanna have, uh, see other classes related to website stuff, or if you're interested in that e-commerce for small business coming up in January. All right, well, Thank you so much, Erica. I You're don't welcome. know about everybody who was watching, but I was just really loving this. Um, I like to interact on this stuff as well. And my husband is a former journalist. And when I, I am hoping that for once I can be the one to deliver some <laughs> trivia and say, did you know HTML is built based on the newspaper? So hopefully we all that I can a take a little bit home. more nerdy tonight. <laughs> Yeah, well, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Please do take a minute, fill out that survey. Check out Erica's class we have coming up at the end of January. We have a couple other classes in January as well. Um, and one final class this year, next week, we have the last in our series of Canva. Uh, this one's based on Canva for food businesses. So if you guys are a food business owner, we also have lots of archived content about Canva social media. So check those out, but we've got that last class this year and then we'll see you all next year. And my two cents, Canva is a fantastic resource to use. Yes. Yeah, I would call myself a novice beginner, but we have Hannah on our team who is <laughs> far, far, far more experienced. Like, I'm moving <laughs> the wrong way. Ah! <laughs> yeah, she teaches those classes. I push the buttons. So um, thanks again, Erica. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Have a great night, and we will see you all next time. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate your time.